We'll make a start. Mr. Haswell, can we have the Cedron and apologies, please? Thank you, Leader. I have an apology from Councillor Marshall and also from Councillor Wiper. Move on to um, declarations of interest. Councillor Stitt. I have to declare an interest in the motion, page uh, item number 4, I'm employed by the MLA. Councillor Wood. Just a clarification on social landlords' arrears recovery. Does that bring in all landlords, or are we... No, I didn't think... No, that. sorry, it's the Registered Social Landlords, yes. DGHP, etc. No, that's what I thought. I just wanted clarification, thank you. Move on to the next item of business, which is proportionality, committee arrangements and senior member appointments. Um, we have the report in front of us. It contains five recommendations. The first three are for noting, since the Council has no locus. And the fourth relates to proportionality, unless members tell me otherwise. I am assuming that we maintain our existing basis of proportionality, in which case committee memberships are set out in the appendix. And uh, we have a recommendation for uh, to appoint senior chairman and vice chairman and senior councillors as appropriate. Colleagues, in the 14 years I have been an elected member of this authority, my main aim has been to do the best for the people of Dumfries and Galloway. This principle has guided this administration and our continued dedication to doing the best we can, whatever the circumstances. In the past 16 months, this council has started to make real progress with a clear direction and a strong vision. We are delivering on our 52 commitments and what we are now achieving in every area of this Council's activity is gaining wider and greater recognition regionally, nationally and across Britain. Today, members of our Council's resilience team will find out if they have won a national award in recognition of their sterling service during the severe weather in March. Only yesterday, this Council received high praise from the external auditors on our continued improvement. Our revenues and benefits team are now nationally recognised as a leading example of good practice in managing the introduction of welfare reform. Our Chief Executive is at the heart of the work on the Commonwealth Games legacy and the introduction of superfast broadband across Dumfries and Galloway. We are tackling the long-standing financial problems in social work services pushing ahead with the integration of adult health and social care in our education department through the Cluster Working Review, Dumfries Learning Town and Dalbiti Learning Campus. We have the potential to create a model of education that will be the envy of Scotland. The economic regeneration of our region is progressing and we have introduced a £5 million apprenticeship scheme to combat our youth unemployment. Administration is not about posts and positions, but what you want to achieve. This week, following negotiations, we made a joint offer to the Labour Group inviting them to form a new tripartite administration, which would have delivered both the stability and the fresh start that has been spoken of outside this chamber. In doing so, we took the view that the people we were elected to serve would welcome and approve of this more collaborative, positive and proportional approach. It is a matter of great regret that this offer has been rejected. I therefore wish to table the following proposal on behalf of the administration, the work that has already been done and the great potential we have to achieve in the future of, is in your hands. Mr Haslab, I would propose that the Chair of Planning, Housing and Environment is Councillor Jim McClung, Vice Chair of social work would be Councillor Ian Blake. The Wigton Area Committee Chair would be Graham Nicholl. Provost of Dumfries in this deal would revert to Area Chair. And that uh, 
In Councillor McClung taking up the post of Chairman of PH&E, we propose that Vice Chairmanship should go to Councillor Finlay Carson. Um, we would like to think that in the role of um, opposition, constructive opposition, that the Chair of Scrutiny would be a Labour Councillor and the Vice Chair of Audit and Risk may be taken up by uh, the independent group if they were looking to do that. We would also propose to agree to establish an ad hoc subcommittee, the remit of which will be to examine the processes in respect of a business bureau, the development of the role of constructive opposition, member involvement in the budget process, and other relevant topics to be agreed. We would also propose that COSLA representation should be uh, op opened up and we would look to have um, proportionality in there with one Labour member and one independent member taking up a post. And with that, we would also like to think that the strategic partnership representation would also be opened up to allow one Labour group member to be on that committee along with the independent uh, group member currently there. Thank you very much. Deputy Leader. Thank you, Leader. I have pleasure in seconding your motion, but that's tempered with regret that what Labour, that what members are being asked to decide upon does not include the option which was proposed to colleagues for a fresh administration that would have benefited from the experience and abilities of all three groups. How often we have been asked by our constituents why can't you all just work together? Our proposal would have shown the public that when it really matters, we are prepared to do just that. The events of the past 10 days have damaged the reputation of this Council, and our proposal would have gone a long way toward restoring a degree of public trust and respect. As the Leader has said, this was our preferred option and one which we believed has great merit. But we also recognise that there is a further option which the Leader has proposed. That will include a broader spread of opinion. I believe this will develop a more inclusive approach to the way in which this Council conducts its business. No single group has a monopoly on good ideas and constructive proposals. The strength of a tripartite coalition would have been to bring off those good ideas and constructive proposals to the fore. That said, the measures we have proposed today will go a long way toward achieving that aim. The proposal we have moved and seconded today clearly provides for a new way of working, which I hope all members will consider carefully. Thank you. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you. Uh, uh, position regarding the administration in the Council. In the last year, the Labour Group had more councillors elected than any other party and received more votes than any other party. We made clear that the Labour Party had a mandate to form an administration and we put forward detailed policy proposals for a progressive coalition and give the Council strong and stable leadership. In May, the SNP chose to ignore the wishes of the people of Dumfries and Galloway. Now, as we fully expected, they are treating the people of our region with utter contempt by continuing to prop up a Conservative-led council that has been reduced to a rump. We now have the ridiculous situation where there are more councillors in the SNP group who support the leader of Conservatives than there are councillors in the Conservative group who support him. The SNP are the biggest group in a coalition but have decided, for some reason, to have the leader of a group of just eight as their council leader. It's an affront to democracy and shows that in Dumfries and Galloway, the SNP have joined at the hip of the Tory party. I've got to be fair, though, the Tory group, they have agreed to an administration in which they have a council leader who will still be told to do by his deputy leader so little changes for them. 
Over the past few days, there have been discussions involving all groups in the Council. In those discussions, the only issue the coalition groups have been interested in is keeping certain councillors in a job. However, in the region, the legacy of the Tories and SNP and the respective UK and Scottish governments is that Dumfries and Galloway is becoming an economic basket case. Unemployment is now above the national average, youth employment is out of control, and we have the shameful record as the lowest paid region in Scotland and all on this council coalition watch. When will this leader and deputy leader start to worry about the jobs of the people at Dumfries and Galloway instead of only worrying about their own jobs? Over the past two years, we have had an arrogant administration which has made a point of voting against anything the Labour group has put forward for the sake of it. How dare the SNP and Tories today pretend that they want to work with Labour after the last two years' conduct? Whether it is our proposals on the Council priorities, our plans for extending community wardens or delivering jobs for young people through the expansion of the apprenticeships, they have all been voted down. Alternative budgets haven't even been read by the administration, never mind properly considered. I can assure what's left of this discredited administration, the Labour group will put forward our alternative policies with more vigour than ever before in the months ahead. Maybe now the leader and deputy leader have lost the confidence of a quarter of their own coalition, they might start to listen. Councillor Maitland. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, what we have before us today is a travesty, and it masquerades as a democratically elected assembly. The proposition we are being asked to support is that of a cobbled together ragbag coalition supposedly headed by a leader who has failed to attract the support of his own political colours and have no mandate from the electorate to govern. It's deeply ironic that a group which styles itself conservative and unionist finds itself not only propped up but wholly supported by another group whose whole reason for being is to separate Scotland from the United Kingdom. It's equally inexplicable for the SNP group as a majority group not to seek leadership, but that's probably best explained by the disdain in which they're held by their partners in this so-called coalition. This arrangement of a minority administration will not provide the stability which is required in these very difficult times of austerity in making the very tough decisions we will be faced with in the next three years. The public already looks with a jaundiced eye on the machinations of politicians at all levels. And the spectacle before us today of this coalition united only in the abandonment of principle in the pursuit of power and position is an unedifying one, which will be do little to change their perception. In conclusion, I would ask that we think again before committing to this ludicrous arrangement. Thank you. Councillor Maitland. Um, members, I, I frankly am extremely distressed by the tone of these remarks. I don't think you'll be surprised to hear that. Um, I, I haven't prepared a party political rant. I, I I basically agree with consensus politics, and I know that the members who sit as independents um, in my group also agree with that way forward. And I would have been very happy to have seen a tripartite administration. I think that would have been a good way forward. We've got immensely difficult decisions to make in the future, and I am very sorry that that hasn't worked. However, I have to point out that this offer uh, to us um, to play our part um, in terms of the best way of providing influence and that is without any shadow of a doubt through leadership and vice leadership of a committee 
um, would only have come about, and this has only come about, because you have lost support in your group. So uh, I thank you for the offer, uh, and I hope that we may have a recess in order to discuss this, because this, of course, is the very first time that this has ever been mentioned to us. I think we've just heard from the Labour Party leader why a tripartite agreement wouldn't work. Because I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't think the will um, and the goodwill exists. I am not in the business of running down this region. It's too important. And I would really urge members to stop doing this and to think seriously about the people out there who, yes, have problems, as the Labour Party has suggested, but we are all trying to work these things out and bring things forward. I don't think I've got anything else to say at this stage, uh, Leader. Um, I hope you would give us a recess and time to look at this. Councillor Crothers. Thank you. I'm not going to add any, any other comments in a negative manner. I think the, the reputation of the Council's almost on its knees at the moment. Uh, and I'll leave it at that point there. I, I think the same as what Council Maitland has just put forward and as far as we need to take a recess. It's the first time certainly the Independent Conservative and Unionist Group have heard that version of that proposal. So if we could ask it, that, that could be done to make comment when we come back, please. If there's no other, can we break for half an hour? Quarter to three. Um. There's no one otherwise minded. Councillor Nicholson. Ch Chair, um, during, the, during the recess, we've had a look at you know, the, the papers and we've had a look at your, your proposition. But during that recess, there has been another, a number of other propositions within that. Uh, now, it make it open and transparent. I think that you know, it is important that everybody has a chance to put their proposals on the table and therefore I would ask, I would move that we defer this item to next week. I would second that. Councillor Scobie, were you wishing to speak? Not on that subject, Chairman. You know, I, I want to see what the, the outcome of that is, uh, but it's just on the proportionality, uh, if you permit me to make the point. Yeah, Chair, and I, I heard what Ronnie said, you know, and it'll come as no surprise. We didn't expect to be spoken to, nor were we, uh, or with rather than to. Uh, so, uh, in all due respect to, to Ted, Ted spoke with us uh, only today uh, with regards to the way things were panning out. I think I spoke in the corridor to an independent member, and, and indeed, that independent member happened to say, and I'll, I'll uh, not mention any names, but that, that uh, as part of the deal, the, the commodity for the independence w w was very costly, uh, I, I think were, was the words that were used. And, you know, and if one chair, or, or one cha vice chair rather, uh, is a cost worth paying, then I'll leave that with the independents to consider. Uh, our position is, uh, or uh, we have not aspired to anything, nor uh, do we aspire uh, to anything within the administration? But what I would ask is that under 4, or particularly 4.1, where it refers to proportionality uh, in particular, that uh, in a democratic uh, situation, that the council uh, consider that it drops to no uh, less than a nine-member committee that is for ad hoc committees as well, so that each group uh, is then entitled to a, a place at that table and to have what has been described as a consensus politics. Uh, I think the last time I heard that was in 1995 uh, by a chief executive. Uh, and uh, I think it was to take down the Berlin walls or, or the Chinese walls that existed at that time. I think that people are still in their silos. However, uh, that whoever is uh, or does uh, form the administration and the council consider that in terms of proportionality that we do not drop below a nine-person committee. 
I'm happy to move that, Chair, if it's indeed uh, I'm happy required. to second, Chair. Well, we have a procedural vote first, um, which is whether we defer for the consideration for a week. Um, I don't think that's uh, going to give stability within this council, and I would actually think we should actually go ahead today and try and make sure that we actually take this council forward. I'd move that we don't defer. We have a motion and an amendment, Leader. Members ready to go to the vote? I'll get uh, the Governance Officer to clarify the vote. That are we ready to go to the vote? Yes. Mr Haswell? The, the motion, sir, is by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor Ian Carruthers, and that is that consideration of this report uh, be deferred for uh, the, 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 the link has been used. Uh, I don't have the diary in front of me, but deferred for no, for no more than a week. Uh, the amendment is by the leader, seconded by the deputy leader, and that is that you proceed to consider the business before uh, the, 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 the committee today. Is that correct? Are you ready to proceed to the vote, leader? Yes. Leader. Amendment. Deputy leader. Amendment. Councillor Bell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Brodie. Motion. Councillor Ian Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Cam Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Carson. Amendment. Councillor Davidson. Amendment. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Dick. Amendment. Councillor Diggle. Motion. Councillor Drabra. Motion. Councillor Dykes. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Foster. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Councillor Gilroy. Amendment. Provost Drim. Motion. Councillor Yen. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor McCorsey. Motion. Councillor McClung. Amendment. Councillor McCollum. Amendment. Councillor McCutcheon. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Mill. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Nicholson. Motion. Councillor Nicholl. Amendment. Councillor Ogilvy. Motion. Councillor Peacock. Motion. Councillor Prentice. Motion. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Smith. Motion. Councillor Stitt. Motion. Councillor Simon. Motion. Councillor Tate. Motion. Councillor Stephen Thompson. Amendment. Councillor Ted Thompson. Motion. Councillor Tuckfield. Motion. Councillor Witts. The motion is carried by 26 votes to 18. Now we move on to item 4, Councillor Stitt. <laughs> Councillor Thompson, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was waiting until the, the room cleared slightly. Um, 
The normal privatisation of a already profitable universal service in public ownership is in my view an old time fire sale led by the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition. It's opposed by the majority of the public who in polls have voted against privatisation by 70% against and 20% in favour. It's also opposed by 96% of the postal workers who deliver this essential service. In our own predominantly rural areas, the effect of this will inevitably lead to increased charges. A reduced delivery service, a private company will have to charge VAT, which will add 12 pence to the price of a first class stamp which has already been increased from 46 pence to 60 pence when the government removed regulatory control to make it more attractive to investors. It will also have a negative effect on rural post offices in small towns and villages, which will lead to their demise. Even in the most free market economy in the world, the United States of America, they have retained the US mail as a publicly owned service. Currently, the Royal Mail provides a pre-post service for our armed forces, and it is unlikely that a privatised service would maintain this, and neither could they be compelled to do so. This service currently provides a boost to our soldiers, sailors and airmen who are engaged in, con in combat. In conclusion, I would move that this Council agrees that the Royal Mail remains in public ownership and that it remits the leader of this council to write to the Prime Minister expressing our opposition to the privatisation of this essential public service. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Lever. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. As many, as many members will recall, a similar motion came to full council around two years ago and received unanimous support of all parties and all members. The all-important agreement the Royal Mail has with the Post Office, under which the Post Office provides Royal Mail products and services, is crucial to the long-term future of many post offices. The future of the Royal Mail and the viability of individual post, post offices are inextricably linked. The importance of the universal service obligation, whereby the cost of delivering mail to remote properties is the same as that to properties in the centre of cities, remains unchanged and is vital to numerous households throughout Dumfries and Galloway. I trust that this motion will again receive unanimous support from all members of this council. I'm happy to second the motion. Councillor Davidson. Thank you, Leader. Um, after the, uh, the high drama of a moment ago, perhaps nice to inject a note of consensus. Uh, I certainly do agree with the terms of the motion. Um, in considering it, I also reflected on uh, the work that we're doing with uh, Next Generation Broadband in, in, in the region. It's interesting to note that the reason for the very large uh, injections of public money that are going to be required in order to uh, deliver next generation broadband for, for this big rural area is because of market failure. Market forces themselves will not deliver that infrastructure. It's curious then that we are looking at uh, a situation where there will be a substantial privatisation of, uh, of the Royal Mail at the same time as which we are investing so heavily in uh, measures to improve the connectivity um, of the region um, goes so far as to say that the one without the other is not necessarily all that good an idea. You can have super fast broadband and that's very good but if you're a local business and you have to pay over the odds to uh, deliver anything uh, out of this region to the rest of uh, uh, the rest of the country or even further afield um, the, the, the investment that we've made in the connectivity uh, will never be as effective if you don't have the balance and infrastructure of the publicly owned Royal Mail service. Um, I, I do think that's something that ought to be reflected on. In my view, um, the, the Royal Mail should be regarded as a, uh, an item of national infrastructure rather than simply as a business. I, I don't think that um, necessarily the full impacts of what may happen with this in terms of our most rural and remote areas, of course, of which we are one, have yet been fully thought through. Uh, so I certainly do support this motion, and uh, I would hope that there is unanimity and consensus across the Chamber in favour of it. Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, I think the last time uh, I campaigned on this issue was the, the run-up to the 1997 elections, and, and, and we all know what the position was then when 
uh, the, the, the Tories were uh, intending to privatise uh, the Royal Mail. Uh, as was said by the, the mover and indeed the seconder, and particularly Jeff, in terms of consensus, uh, then we had the unanimous support of, of all the political groups, and I ho would hope that maturity will uh, remain indeed. I think it was Alex Salmon just this week, uh, as leader of the SNP, said that you know, he, he, he would, uh, in an independent Scotland, then uh, re-nationalise uh, the, the Royal Mail against that. <coughs> uh, but I hope it never comes to that, that in, the, in this chamber today, that we have that maturity that has been expressed by Rob, uh, and that we get the support uh, for this, uh, the motion that is down before us today. It will have a devastating effect on rural areas, and that was the point in 1997. That will still be the case where people, uh, if it is privatised, will have to collect their mail rather than it being delivered as a universal service. So in that respect, uh, and the protection of rural areas and the Royal Mail as a universal service, I would hope that we do get the unanimous support in this chamber today uh, from cross-party. Councillor Maitland. Um, well, I won't be. Um, I, um, I, I think, looking at this paper, um, it's not so much that I take a view on whether to privatise or not privatise, because the information in this report is so slender as to be, frankly, um, unusable. In this new world, um, leader, which I hope eventually we do get going, um, where we will bring forward um, policy options and consider things in a mature manner, uh, leading to papers which come forward with options in them, which I hope very much is what we will have. Um, that is uh, something then that we could then get our teeth into because we can consider on the one hand this, on the other hand that, and come to a balanced and considered um, thought. That sort of level of information is not here. It is quite inappropriate for us to take a view. Um, and I would suggest that we simply note the intention and leave it at that. Councillor Brodie. Thanks, thanks, Chair. I'm also not going to support the motion. I think that there is an emotional uh, argument to keep the Royal Mail, but uh, it's been with us for many over over a century, except when the Labour Party changed its name to Consignia for some strange reason. But the rational the, the rational argument is in favour of of privatising 51% of of Royal Mail. They, they compete in a, a very competitive marketplace where, where the, well, most of the business is parcel, and in order to compete in that market, they need the money from, from privatisation uh, to invest in the infrastructure. I think Liberal Democrats have worked very hard to keep the universal service six days of the week throughout the country, the same price for sending a letter to to the freeze as to John Groats. So I, th I think we have won the, right, won, the, won the right to keep the universal service, and I think that's an important thing. Uh, a more eloquent speech you can find in the Liberal Democrat uh, website from Vince Cable, who says it a lot, a lot better than me. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Dick. Thanks. I think it's a, an important principle to, to support, but I think the, the uh, evidence for me, and it's no coincidence that uh, America, the biggest capitalist uh, country in the world, not only has its mail service and private ownership, but its rail service, and perhaps we could uh, take a lesson from that. Right. If there's no one else wishing to comment, we have a motion and an amendment. Uh, thank you, Leader. The motion is by Councillor Ted Thompson, seconded by Councillor Jeff Leader, and it is as set out in paragraph 3.2 of the report before members. The amendment by Councillor Maitland, seconded by Councillor Brodie, is that the Council merely note the intention to privatise the Royal Mail. Is that correct? Councillor Maitland, is that correct? I think it is, yes. <laughs> it's, it's not going to win, so let's not worry too much. So the motion, the motion is, as per the paper, the amendment is to note the situation. 
leader. Amendment. Deputy leader. Amendment. Councillor Bell. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Brody. Amendment. Councillor Ian Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Karen Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Carson. Amendment. Councillor Davidson. Motion. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Diggle. Um. Councillor Driver. Motion. Councillor Dykes. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Forster. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Motion. Councillor Gilroy. Amen. Provost Green. Not present. Councillor Yen. Councillor Lever. Councillor McCautry. Motion. Councillor McClung. Motion. Councillor McCoom. Motion. Councillor McCutcheon. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Mill. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Nicholson. Motion. Councillor Nicholl. Councillor Nicholl. Is that my name? Yes. Amendment. Amendment. <laughs> Councillor Ogilvie. Motion. Councillor Peacock. Motion. Councillor Prentice. Amendment. Councillor Scooby. Motion. Councillor Smith. Councillor Stitt. Not present. Declared the interest. Sorry. Councillor Syme. Motion. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Stephen Thompson. Motion. Councillor Tate Thompson. Motion. Councillor Tuckfield. Amendment. Councillor Woods. The motion is carried by 23 votes to 18. Welfare um, item 5 is the welfare reform, register social landless arrears recovery. Yes. Right. Um, this report sets out the Council's current position on welfare reform and the statutory actions which RSLs require to take before considering an eviction on the grounds of arrears of rent. I am also able to inform members that a letter has been sent on behalf of the Welfare Reform Subcommittee to the Petitions Committee of the Scottish Parliament in support of the stance taken by the Govan Law Centre in seeking changes to Section 16 of the 2001 Housing Act to prevent so-called bedroom tax arrears being used to establish or justify a request in court for eviction. Uh, this is a follow-up to the letter sent previously by the Chair of the Housing Subcommittee. So we have the report in front of us. Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, I'm pleased to see the report coming before us. And could I place a record? My thanks to the Welfare Reform Subcommittee for uh, the very uh, the action that it has taken and the debate that did take place at the presentation uh, by the RSLs uh, only a few weeks ago. I think it was the case that members did raise the issue of the letters that, are go that have been going out to. Uh, tenants, and it is my opinion that the, the content, the language used, was not conducive with the Council's position, as you rightly outlined, uh, Chair. In 32, Chair, it does uh, refer to uh, that there is no consistent pattern across Scotland. Indeed, uh, it is my understanding that the SNP controlled councils, uh, and I would assume this one as well, 
uh, as a coalition would adopt the, the, the same position, that uh, there would be no evictions in uh, those authorities. Uh, and I would regard Dumfries and Galloway as one of those that would fall into that category. It then followed uh, with the notable decision of the North Lanarkshire Council, where, uh, as a Labour controlled, it also adopted a no eviction policy when it faced the issue of a disabled person uh, uh, and the evictions uh, proceedings, uh, notably in that authority. So while there is no uh, consistency, then the Welfare uh, Subcommittee and endorsed by this full council have remained consistent in that they have supported the Govern Law Centre petition where it is asking the, the, at first the Petitions Committee and now the Welfare Committee at the Parliament to adopt a no eviction policy brought about by the, the bedroom tax and tenants falling into arrears. And I would hope that this Council will remain consistent uh, with that particular uh, policy and the letters that have been written. So in respect of 3.7 and the letters that have been written and where it has or indicates that the RSLs are indeed uh, reviewing their letters, I would hope that we, we, we could go further than what it states in 3.5 and uh, put it to the RSLs that we will not be looking for any evictions. I think it was Colin, Colin Smythe, that eloquently put the, the, the case at the Welfare Reform Committee that there is a route that the, the RSLs can follow where they do not treat the debt uh, as uh, one that needs to go, that's those that fall into arrears uh, as a result of the bedroom tax, and it can be identified, it can be uh, uh, decoupled, that we would not look for a, a, an eviction in Dumfries and Galloway in line with uh, party uh, policies, uh, and that we uh, look for the change in the language that's used where it's threatening and intimidating. I have provided the Welfare Reform Subcommittees uh, of these letters where, you know, it's right down to how much uh, tenants could face uh, if court action is uh, proceeded uh, in that respect. So, Chair, uh, I would move that we go further than what is contained in, in 3.5 and look for the RSLs not to be pursuing the debt through the uh, eviction uh, route, but if they are so minded uh, that they treat that as a normal debt and can be pursued, as indeed the Council does, on Council tax arrears, etc. Uh, that we look for that as a Council, and that becomes this Council's policy. I would so move to you. Councillor Smith. Thanks, Chair. I mean, the Labour Group position on this is absolutely clear. Bedroom tax is wrong, it's unfair. It attacks the most vulnerable in the community, more than half of the 1,700 households in Dumfries and Galloway affected by the bedroom tax are disabled people. It's an example of a Prime Minister who's strong at standing up against the weak, as somebody said yesterday, but very weak when it comes to standing up against the strong. The report today, however, doesn't capture exactly what was fully agreed at the last meeting of the Welfare Reform Subcommittee. I note what the leader says about a letter going to the Petitions Committee, but what was actually agreed was that a letter should go to the Scottish Government asking them to change the law. The Petitions Committee was looking at the Govern Law Society uh, petition, but the reality is we've moved on from there. There's a member's bill being proposed that will make it illegal for a housing association to evict somebody as a result of the, the bedroom tax. And we asked, and it was agreed, that a letter go to the Scottish Government asking them to change the law in order to achieve that. And that was what was agreed at the meeting, rather than a, a further letter to the Petitions Committee as things have moved on. What was also agreed at the meeting was that the leaders of all the groups would be asked to meet with the directors of the registered social um, house and landlords. It was a proposal, in fact, made by Councillor Geddes, supported and seconded by myself. And I would ask when that meeting is likely to take place. There is no need, as I made clear at the Welfare Reform Subcommittee, for a registered social landlord to evict anybody as a direct result of the bedroom tax. If I didn't pay my electricity bill, the electricity company wouldn't evict me, they would take me to court and they would get the money out of me. If you can afford to pay, there are ways in which that money can be taken off you. There is no need to evict anybody. 
at the end of the day, this council will be the ones that will pick up the tab for that, either through homeless accommodation or indeed the taxpayer will pick up the tab for that because the person evicted will have to move into private um, accommodation and the housing benefit bill for private accommodation is higher than it is for um, social housing. So I would ask that the actions that were agreed at the Welfare Reform Subcommittee be enacted as soon as possible, that we write to the Scottish Government making it clear that we support a change in the law and that we meet with the directors of the social housing landlords to make it clear that this Council believes there should be no evictions as a result of the bedroom tax. Councillor Geddes. Amen to that, Leader. Uh, my question really would be, A, has the letter been sent to the RSLs in Dumfries and Galloway asking for the meeting, and B, if that's the case, what response have we received thus far, sir? Mr Lynch. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, a, a letter's not been issued to the RSLs yet as uh, we wait in confirmation of the finalised minutes of the Welfare Reform Subcommittee, which was received uh, last Friday morning. So it will be pro uh, progressed uh, very quickly now that we have the full minute of the meeting. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Geddes. I, I, I understand what Mr Lynch is saying, sir, and you know, I have more respect for him than, than, than disparage him, but we should be putting in place some form of protocol which allows this council and issues of, of, of such nature, uh, in fact, you know, to, to, to get correspondence communications issued with the due degree of urgency. I rather suspect, and I'm looking at the governance officer, that that already exists. And if that is the case, can I suggest, Leader, please, that we make unremitting use of it? I would have thought, quite frankly, that if there's no recall, following the, the expiry of the possible period of recall from a, from a committee or a subcommittee decision, you go on and you do the business in the back of it. Leader, there would appear to have been some sort of glitch here. Uh, I'll address this out with this council meeting. Uh, there are operational arrangements in place that there would appear to have been something not going right here. And I'm not suggesting at Mr Lynch's level. With that, if there's no other speakers, Councillor Maitland. Um, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain what you're about to do, um, uh, Leader, because... Uh, <laughs> Um, if, if I'm being an, given an offer simply to note the current position, um, then is that what's, what you're about to agree to? Mr Haswell, if you could just... Uh, the sequence of events say uh, Councillor Scobie moved a motion that this council uh, request RSLs not to use evictions uh, in, in the case of arrears arising from the so-called bedroom tax and that they be asked to pursue debt uh, as, as normal debt arising in those circumstances. Councillor Smith then went on to ask about the actions agreed at the Welfare Reform Subcommittee, and we've, we've heard about the letter to the Scottish Government, and also uh, for the leaders of groups to meet with the RSLs. Uh, I'm taking it that if Councillor Scobie and, uh, and Smith are at one on that, that would be a proposed decision of this Council. I'm at one on, on, on that. Addition of what uh, Colin introduced. What Councillor Scobie is proposing is what is council policy already and been agreed by the Welfare Reform Subcommittee, which is that there should be no evictions. Um, and what we're asking for is the decisions taken by the Welfare Reform Subcommittee are implemented. Councillor Geddes. Thanks, Leader. That's it precisely, as far as I'm concerned. And in saying that, and agreeing with Councillor Smith, I'm not, you know, endeavouring in any circumstances you know, to try and sideline the motion that Councillor Scobie's put forward. But at the end of the day, that's already council policy. Let's get on and implement it. Councillor Dykes. I just wanted some clarification, but I'm under, I understand that what Councillor Scobie's requesting is something that's already been asked for at the subcommittee, and therefore that should be implemented. Is that correct? Yeah. Happy to reiterate Council policy, Chair, and that makes it uh, abundantly clear, and, and that, uh, that's why I'm moving it, and it's for Council to, to determine, you know, and, and it will endorse, as it has done already. I think the consensus is that, could we just get somebody to actually get on and write the letter, and we'll get it up the road to where it needs to be, 
and we'll get the letters written out to invite the RSLs to come in and meet with the leaders of the groups to discuss the situation. Thank you, Leader. That will be done. Are members happy with that? Okay. Right. Um, I have no further business. We have a proposal for a date for a special meeting, which is a Tuesday, 1st of October at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and the option is to move THES it's to... Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's scheduled for 2 p.m. That's the next Tuesday. There's, there's only one item on PH&E next week anyway, so that seems reasonable to me. I have no further business. Thank you for your attendance.